Hello everyone, welcome back to Fableheim, an acolyte of the altar. I'm glad that everyone enjoyed the first episode. Today is the game's full release on Steam, so I thought it was only appropriate to flip the coin a little bit. Last time we played Empiricist as our greater patron and the Ravagers. I almost call them savages. And the lesser patron. Well, the Savage Ravagers today shall be our greater patron and the Empiricists our lesser patron. So let's see just how different the game is by flipping our patrons in their order. Now, of course, we could show off the Sylvans, but then I'd have to play as tree huggers, so perhaps another day. The greater patron with the Ravagers starts us with a 1-1 vent crawler, and honestly... That doesn't sound very impressive, but I do think it could be quite helpful. Not as helpful as healing by three after every combat, but helpful. Hopefully, the same strategy will work. The Ravagers will be our early mid game, and the Empiricists will be our late game and or our means of survival, courtesy of our one mana cost chanting cultists. We are faced against the Gilded Grifter. This Poor Sap was not in our previous video. He's going to take a hit from the little crab. He has the Grifter's Game. He shows us up to four cards. Which one did not come from your hand? Choose correctly. Add the card to your hand. Choose incorrectly and take four damage. Our hand, thankfully, was three tiny disciples and one little golem boy, so it was the Koi. The Crumbling Gargoyle. This is from the Ravager Primary Deck. It is a two mana five one. Actually, is this a um, this is a forbidden card? So this was given to us by our patron. How kind of him! This is a five-one that deteriorates. Music disappear for a second. Uh, every turn, it will lose one attack. Now, the gilded grifter is also going to prod us with his finger. It's very rude. He'll be dealing one to the leftmost minion, and he also has work the crowd, which is going to be activated next turn, where the prods come to my face. It's very rude. I also wasn't paying attention, but I'm assuming it's this one. Yes, fantastic. The Masked Dawn Rider is from our Empiricist deck. We play it and we kill a targeted creature, an ally creature, and steal its stats. It's fantastic. Well, it's quite rude, honestly, but we'll work it out, I'm sure. All shall be forgiven. The thing that wasn't in my deck is the Lamb. The Lamb is a frontliner, which means it will spawn on the left side instead of the right side. And the serve turn, restore one health to this creature. It is a 1-4, so it's nothing fantastic. But what we can do is we can play the Macedon Rider and destroy the crumbling golem, gargoyle, so that it's no longer deteriorating. And we just borrowed its stats. It's, it's all going to work out. So far, everything is going nice and smooth. Let's, um, hope it continues to do so. Ah, would you look at that? Another Mastodon Rider. We could Mastodon Rider our Mastodon. That would be something. But I believe we are nearing our first glorious victory. And would you look at that? I didn't even take any HP damage. All thanks to the little cultists. Perhaps I spoke too soon. Koi is not in my hand. Ha ha! By the way, with the Grifter's game, um, we take damage. Four damage. If we choose incorrectly. So I almost lost four health, but I remembered. The Gilded Grifter, I think, is like the easiest boss in the game, if you can remember what was in your hands. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is Borrelia, the Mind Turner. This is the ultimate win condition. At 10 mana. Plop down to 17-17. And the enemy targets itself with all damage next turn. That's very good. Alright. We'll take that as our win con. Now we just need to like bulk up our early and our mid game. Add a card with customizable stats to your hand. You have my curiosity. The Ink Drinker. 
Okay, play deals one. Inspect me well in hand, then click to edit attack, health, or damage dealt. Is it averaging it out? So what if I make this an 8? An 8? Uh... Three. Who are we playing? This guy? He does swipe. That's kind of annoying. Let's make it a 6-3. Wait. How much can I make this? One one deal 7 <laughs> This is an interesting card. Um, let's do deal one. Wait, what if, can I make this deal zero? Deal zero, it'll make it a seven, three. Four mana, seven, three. Four mana, eight, three. Four mana, eight, three. We'll do that. Okay, that's cool. I've never seen that before. Anyway, I got distracted. Uh, this is the angler. We did face him in our previous video. And um, I don't like him. I don't like him at all. He has the prod that we are also familiar with. But he also plops down the lantern lure. So, he plops it on our side. And whenever it dies, it deals two damage to my face, which is rude. But it also gives minus one attack to any of its neighboring creatures. And it deals 3 damage to a random creature every time a spell is cast. So we'll plop down our crumbling gargoyle, smack him in the face a little bit, and move on to the next turn. The Ink Drinker is fascinating. It has certainly piqued my curiosity. Now Swipe is coming in. This deals 1 to all creatures. So we could play the Chanting Cultist. I actually think I'm going to. I don't care about it. So we'll play this and we'll see if it can eat the minus one attack here. See what it can do. We're also going to take two to the face. So the, the plus two temporary HP, in my opinion, it did eat the minus one. Look at that. Uh, is way more important than anything the cultist does for me. So we'll go ahead and plop down the ink drinker. Part of me wonders if you can make it like a 0-1 deal 10 or something to be worth it. But if he even get, if he gets to swing twice, I think that automatically makes uh, his value worth it. So what we can do, we can try and protect him a little bit by playing the lamb. That moves him to the front here. And that will protect 1 HP from prod. Then we can uh, play this guy for some HP. Why not? Smack. That was a big smack. We got a fat smack. Uh, Mastodon. Do we want to Mastodon anything? Probably not. I mean, I could Mastodon this guy. You know what? Let's do that. It's not like he can attack anyway. Smack, smack, smack. He's alive at two. All right. Well, that was interesting. I'm a big fan of this. That allows you to kind of edit this guy however you, uh... Whatever you need, you can make it happen. Do you need an early game card? Do you need a mid game card? Do you need a late game card? This relic is for you. I think it should be worth more than just one. The Insect Collector. Oh, two mana, one, one, summon a one, two. That could be really good. Your Raptor Shot, deal six. Amount is 20% of enemy's max life. Five mana for that, huh? I don't know. Lava Moss Smith is excellent. This was in our previous video. I'm a big fan of this guy. But let's get the Insect Collector. Let's try a little bit of a Zerg strategy. I mean, the Lava Moss Smith synergizes exceptionally well with that, but... Um... Trixie Hunter? False Prophet? I'll go Trixie Hunter. 
Still as stone. Still as stone, the man mutters, holding his spear close to his chest, before him graze a group of small fuzzy creatures and the much larger mother. Soup of bones, soup of bones, he says. He raises his spear and begins to charge. Which do you help him hunt? We can hunt the little creatures just for some little life regain, but we are max health. So what we can do is we can hunt the mother to claim the filling feast and lose two to eight life. Let's gamble. We lost three. Pretty good. This gives us the filling feast, which is a forsaken card. Not a forsaken card. A card that forsakes. I highly recommend getting a filling feast whenever you can. Against, like, for every deck, really. It, it can save your life. It will save your life. So this is the Messenger Scribe. Okay, we got some star beams going on. Future Strike. Deal one. Unlike other counterattacks, Future Strike happens before the creature deals damage. So out of curiosity, let's say 0, 1, deal 30. Deal 10. Hmm. I wonder if that's worth it. Interesting. Because Starbeam is going to make it very difficult to keep anything on the field. If, I, if I'm right, this is like deal six, I think. So zero, one, deal ten. For six mana, feels pretty good. Okay. I think I can edit it later if we if I change my mind. But um, I don't have anything to play on turn one. So... I could make this guy something to play on turn one, I suppose. Meh. Oh, it's going to kill the crab if I attack. Okay, we'll hold. I'm not sure if it's going to matter, but we'll wait. It might matter. It might not. Ooh, this will also kill the gargoyle. Oh, that's annoying. But we can actually counteract that here. Because if we attack with the crab and the gargoyle, it'll hit the crab first. Here's engaged, deal one direct damage to me. That's unfortunate. Starbeam, deal 12. Cool. So what we can do is we can play this. And then we'll have these two attack. Future Strike will hit, kill that. And then he'll take four. And, um... <laughs> Deal six. That's what I thought. I thought it was six. No, it's twelve. Cool. Very cool. Hmm. I might need to turn. I might need to change the ink trigger. We'll keep it as it is for now. I'm not going to attack. We'll attack next turn. The lamb is more useful than I thought. We're going to take a lot of damage here. We'll go Chanting Cultist into the Mana Pool Key. Boy. I think we're going to keep the, the Ink Drinker 0-1 deal 10. I might even try to just boost its damage up. Kame, Kame. Ooh, an insect collector. That could be good. Sure. We're literally just flooding the board to not take Starbeam to the face. <laughs> That's all we're doing. I could have played uh, the Tiny Disciple here. I believe my board is full now. And that, my friends, is actually a very successful encounter. My temp HP absorbed all the shots. Our trash ate all the star beams. And now the ink drinker deals the killing blow. Well done. Well done. 
I love this relic. It's so good. Alrighty. Vein Drainer. Lose two life. I don't like that. Grant me attack equal to the number of other creatures you have. I don't like that at all. Baphomet the Cruel. Dominate three. So that means I have to kill three units. Charge. Play give me plus the attack this round rally. You can attack again this turn. Now with our Zerg strategy, this might actually be possible. Iron Maiden. When I survive damage, I deal damage equal to my attack. Let's take Baphomet. That could be okay. I mean, our cultists can do something. Ooh. Put a temporary swallow to your hand. It reads, deal one. If this kills a creature, gain three borrow life. Oh. This is counter synergistic with our dominates. Because this would be to kill our own units, right? But it would give us a lot of health, I think. Mini Jelly could be cute, because it does synergize with our with our dominates. A three borrowed life. That could save me. We'll take the mini jelly. Greed is good. We're playing as the Ravagers, so, you know, let's let's go full greed. The Unheeded Messenger. Oh my. The message from above sends a letter to your hand. Read it carefully. I'm not sure what I want the ink drinker to be yet. Think about it. A friendly letter. Offer to read the letter. You cannot end your turn while you hold this card. Acolyte, we need not fight yet. Let us rest a while first. It is not safe here, but I will keep watch. I don't know what that means. Oh, cool. Restore some life. You know what the danger is about that, though? <laughs> the fact that it gave me life means it's going to take life. It has dark plans. The perfect draw would be Baphomet. A solar storm approaches. Take shelter in my cavern, please. Trust me. So I can either... Ah, uh, lose a mana gem, or gain a mana gem, but it will fully advance Calamity, uh, which I believe wipes the board. So, we'll sacrifice a, a little thing to you. No big deal. We're kind of just uh, chipping away at him right now. Like I said, perfect draws Baphomet. Here comes a Slash. Flash is deal 3, Starbeam is deal 12 as we saw, but um, we're doing a little bit of jellyfish as happy as I am. I want to make this a unit. So if we want 4, can I do 8, 0, 4, 3? 8, 3 seems good to me. Boom. Now, Calamity is going to come in. Um, ah, Baphomet would be great, wouldn't it? The fauna here are sick with wolf lung. Drink this, please. Trust me. I can gain 30 beetles, but fully advance the opponent's rage gauge, or I can listen to the messenger and take five. We'll take five. I don't want Calamity. Calamity bad. I think the one time I fought this boss, I ended up taking like 15. Which is, of course, unacceptable. 
Man, no Baphomet. The game is rude. The game fears Baphomet. That's okay. Doesn't matter. Valdrada. Advance enemy rage gauges by one. End of turn if awaking. Gain five borrowed life. That is a dangerous game. Draw your highest cost creature, then reduce the new highest in your one by hand. This would be to draw our wind con, which I don't really need to do. It's 10 mana. We'll draw that naturally. Corrupted Choir scares me. <clears throat> I don't really want to play Valdrada because that was our... That was a big finisher we had last time. And we already have the, the Mind Turner, right? So... We don't really need a Valdrada. I'll take the Corrupted Choir. Goodness gracious, it scares me. It scares me so. But there are some bosses like this that literally have fully awakened stuff, like turn two. So you know, at the end of the day, is it really that big of a deal? I don't think so. This is the Uncovered Gold Cap. This is a very annoying boss, because he acts every single turn. Isn't that infuriating? Truly. Unacceptable. So what he does is he befuddles, which can switch the HP and the attack of a random minion. And then he will attack for two damage two to three times. So this entire board can be wiped. Of course, we deal damage, every time that happens. And if he does not take damage, he will deal three to me, which is... Oh, that's rude. That's a rude boy. Pop down our little lamb. Now, unfortunately, no matter which of these he befuddles means they're going to die instantly, so... Yeah. Dead, dead. It is now going to be very difficult for me to fill this board back up. I could, of course. And no matter what I do, I'm taking three. You hate to see him. All right. Hopefully our 2-2 mana koi stays alive. It's going to be very difficult to play Baphomet in this situation. But, I mean, the good news is every time a minion dies, you know, stuff happens. Feels like I'm just delaying the inevitable, which I guess is true. Oh yeah, wind up punch is never gonna go off if he kills stuff because I'm dealing damage to him. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I basically countered this boss. Wow. There's Baphomet. Where were you last time? Zero one, deal ten. GG. This is so good, holy crap. This relic has carried me so hard. It's beautiful. Another insect collector, ooh. I think I'm, I have a lot of beetles, so I think I'm gonna roll here. I wouldn't mind a second insect collector though. I would not mind this, especially if we do lean into dominate, which, you know. I'm going to try Bound Fury. I think I talked about it previously. But I mean, a 4 mana 7-7 seven, seven is hard to deny. I don't need a second Baphomet. So basically, the turn she summons, she's a 2-2. Two, two. But, next turn she's a 7-7. Seven, seven. 
That's pretty spicy. It's, it's, it's spicy to be at the ball, look. Let's take a shot. Because I'm pretty sure we can purchase food. A large man hunches over a thick metal pot. He has two tables on either side piled with ingredients, some familiar and comforting, others that curdle the stomach. From both appearance and scent. For some humble beetles, we can purchase another filling feast. Now, is it good to have two of these in your deck? Absolutely not. Do I have two of them in my deck? Yes. Unfortunately. Now, we are in a similar situation to previously. We are facing off into the Maestro Maev. Ah, troublesome opponents. Maestro Maev has three passive effects. These are going on every single turn. The parry, deal one to attackers. The piercing gaze, deal one to me. And the soothing song, deal one to him. Now you may ask, why is this so problematic? Well, it is because of Crescendo, which is opening up right now. It empowers all other abilities, raising their effects by plus one. So this will parry for two, this will deal two to my face, and this will heal him. Two. Ah. Now, I could hit him for four. Because he'd, he'd parry... Actually, I'd hit him for six. I'd hit him for six, and then he'd parry, kill this, and then kill that. Or, I can do nothing and prepare for the Baphomet wave. Which I think is the play. Though it pains me. And trust me, it pains me. So basically what we're going to do here is Baphomet. I did not get to pick which ones it dominated, but I'm glad it dominated those. Because Baphomet is going to go here. The Lamb is going to eat this too. He's going to hit for nine. And then... Is Rally not working? Hmm. Well, it's fine. Now, unfortunately... This parry thing is going to happen again. But the lamb did heal a little bit, so at least not gonna die. And we got to uh, get some temporary HP. The cultists are so good. Alright. We're at six mana. Zero, one, deal ten. You know the rules and so do I. We deal ten. We combine all this. That's GG against the Maestro Maya. You love to see it. The man with the goat head. This did so much work for me. So much incredible work. And it plays into the my whole beat him down strategy. It's perfect. It's incredible. My attack, health, and your borrowed life are always equal. No, I don't think so. Take the man of the go ahead. The lamb has done better than I thought because I'm using strategic. I'm using it strategically. I think I'd rather have the man of the go ahead than the Mastodon Rider. I think I would. I get rid of the mana pool koi as well. The koi's are good. Hmm, this is a hot, tough. This is a difficult choice. I think we'll get rid of the Mastodon Rider. One of the features about the Mastodon Rider I didn't talk about is that when the Mastodon Rider dies, it summons a base copy of what I think it consumed. When you attack with four creatures or more, give them plus one plus one this round. That's exceptional, but it will bring my spiritual burden to or uh, yellow. 
which, yeah, you draw one less card. So we'll start with Whimsical Vessel. We are barely in the Light Burden. I, you want to make sure I draw as many things on turn one as possible. Ah, the Shambling City. Oh, the Corrupted Choir is so suspicious here. It's so sus. All right, we did not draw. Not a card to play here, so we won't. The Shambling City. It has a few remaining residents. Four. For each resident that it has remaining, it will deal that damage to the leftmost minion on the field. Which, of course, right now, is the crab. But every attack that he takes to his face will reduce the amount of residents in the field. Unfortunately, he's about to proselytize, which means he will be killing my weakest unit and taking its attack to serve in its is a profane citadel. Of course, that's not all that he can do, and he's about to become way more terrifying. But uh, that's something for us to worry about in a moment. Am I about? To, am I really about to play the corrupted choir? I think I am. Ah, oh, maybe not. Because, okay, so the Corrupted Choir will open Titanic Strike, and then it will make it so White Void opens in two turns, and then White Void is going to wipe it out. What I want to do is I want to play this after White Void has gone off. So we'll play uh, a Mana Pokoi, and I think the Ink Drinker is going to be a late game uh, stat pot. Proselytize will take this in one more turn. Become Titanic Strength. Hmm. I do want Baphomet, but I actually have really good stats on the field right now. We're going to keep that train rolling. But don't worry, it's about to end. I actually don't think I really need... Well, that overkill goes to me. Ow, my face. So here comes the death from White Void. I can play... Killing Feasts? Hmm. I don't want to do this. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to play the lamb and the corrupted choir that will fully enrage him but he's already fully enraged so it doesn't matter and that will start giving me temporary hp so i'm i think i'm safe from the fists i should just play this instead of the lamb i think the proselytize was moved forward because of the enrage that's good to know Uh, next turn is Marilia. So what we we want this to be nine nine deal two. Sure. And um, then we win. The choir has given me so much HP. Holy crap. Yeah, take that Titanic Strike. The only question now is, do I play the Filling Feast? Do I wait? 
Recover seven is pretty good. Now I play Marilia the Mind Turner. This makes it so this turn, all of her effects that would affect me affect her instead. I don't know if that's actually going to mean anything. But, um, it's going to be fun. I think I am going to play one Filling Feast. Because heal seven is pretty good. We're full health. No matter what they do, we're chilling. I guess proselytize doesn't count. But, uh, GG. I didn't want to have two filling feasts in my deck, you know? Hmm. A wave of lava. We saw this in the last video, and it was good fun. I think I used it approximately once. But this time, I don't have the anti-synergy from um, Eye Gouge. Was Filling Feast not taking up a deck slot? Oh my. Well... Replace a lamb. The lamb is the lamb is good like from a strategic level, but not from a stat level, you know. Um blah, 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 blah. So this guy's about to wipe our board. Well, he's gonna deal one to everything, which would wipe the board, but I'm gonna get the insect collector for next turn. And um, I'm just going to smack him. This is the Prophet of a Ruin. He is annoying. Actually, maybe I should have taken the, the Peasants, the Cultists, because he's about to hit me. I forgot about that. Unfortunate. Uh, he has the Self-Fulfilling Prophecy, which makes it so... What do I want to do here? Spawn you first. Uh, if four, if five murder scrolls have been killed, destroy Protective Flock and set the Prophet of Ruins max life to ten. That's a tremendous drop from a hundred and or from two hundred to ten. The Protective Flock is what's spawning these little murderous crows. They deal one to me at the start of my turn, and they are what needs to die to uh, trigger the self-fulfilling prophecy. Thunderstorm makes it so that if they are attacked by three units, deals three to all attackers, and the Raising Dead deals one to everybody, increasing in damage per use. Uh, so I'm going to want to play this to just take the two. And because they're about to be wiped, they don't really want to... Is this after? Yeah, so we can play all this just to kill everything. They're all going to die anyway. Might as well take the chip. Actually, now that I think about it, is there any point in chipping him? I don't think there is. Wait. I just realized... This might be the easiest win of my life. I don't have to do anything. Because this guy is giving me five temporary HP. We're cool. He kills everything. Who could have guessed the choir would come in handy here? We still don't do anything. He gets big mad. Here comes the ruin. And voila! Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll reroll here. Hmm. 
I don't know if I want to... I mean, one mana 4-3 is very spicy. But advancing all rage gauges by one is as equally spicy. When I survive damage, I deal damage equal to my time. Grant me 1-1 one, one for each infested or ignited enemy ability. When you infest an enemy ability, I deal damage equal to my attack. Interesting. So that's like exclusive synergy with uh, the Sylvan. Huh. That's cool. Discard your lowest cost creature. I gain their stats. I don't like discards. Well, look at that. There's Eye Gouge. I kind of don't want to use Eye Gouge because I used it so heavily in my first video, but I'm going to take one on principle. If you're offered an Eye Gouge, can you say no? I don't think so. I still have a heal in the pocket, so we'll play the dice game. A group of nomadic acolytes are playing dice. As bets are made, a small pile of golden beetles builds up in the center. A gambler can take the pot, but to do so is to exit the game. You do as most value the game more than their wealth. Unfortunately, I can't full gamble. Oh my, the king of beggars. You look pretty cool. Pretty sweet. Crab's about to die to something. Couldn't tell you what. I had the rare opportunity of playing Baphomet early. That's, that's pretty fun. But um, we're going to get the Chanting Cultist for a uh, first turn play. The Beggar's Bowl. A bowl of coins given by compassionate strangers. Hard up. Counterattack. Deal five to the first back row target. Then lose one coin from Beggar's Bowl. Can't hit directly. This ability also triggers like normal during the Beast's turn. Okay. So if I hit him, he's going to counter? Yeah. Oh. Interesting. He went for my cultists. That's rude. So if I don't have two units on the field, will that hit my face? That would kind of suck. Down and out. No effect unless the Beggar's Bowl is empty. Deal 13. The Acolyte also damages King of Beggars by the same amount. That could be bad. So this is about to take... 5. I'm a little perplexed about what's going to happen here. This can hit me. Is this going to fill up the bowl? Add one coin, gain five life. I have a question. You may be able to detect what my question will be. I'm going to have that there just to tank. Um, if I gouge hard up, this boss can't do anything, right? <laughs> I think so. My poor little uh, wind condition being used as a, as a tanky boy. I know it hurts, but you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm just spawning stuff. So my plan here is I'm going to lava wave. My, little, my poor little thing is done. So a wave of lava here. 
that deals 10 to him, but it also wildfires all of his abilities. Uh, I could... I suppose I can do this. Yeah. I could have attacked with everything. Okay, so the down and out goes... Okay. Hmm. What happens if I do this? I don't think anything happens. I think we're big chillin'. And wildfire is burning the boss away. Cool. Then we play, uh... Our mind turner, who's being used more as a seventeen seventeen than anything else in this run, <laughs> but that's fine. And um, that's GG. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Grants all creatures one attack. Do you think that persists through it? Because it's a it's a three mana one one with frontline. <laughs> if you think this persists, it's probably worth it. Or is it like a, a lava maw where it's just hmm? I'll reroll. Do I want another wave of lava? <laughs> I do think it's funny. Hmm. Sure. The lamb was very helpful. I respected the lamb. So I think what we'll do is we'll get rid of a chanting cultist. And we march on to the final thing. Zaharu again. That'd be fun, because at least I know what I'm doing there. Haha! -ha, it is harder. And this game has the classic main menu restart. I died by one. By one. It was a perfect lethal. But, uh, not this time. Now I'm going to make right Haru. And we'll, uh, destroy her. So Haru is the Sylvan Deity, of course, the only opponent we could face here at the altar, because we are, once again, the combination of Ravagers and Empiricist. I wonder how it works if you're mono. Does it just roll, flip a coin between the two that you didn't play? But Haru has the cycle. Counterattack if your opponent controls only one creature. Kill it. Which is, of course, why I wanted to play the Kelst. But in order to make this happen... By force, there's Unify, which coalesces all creature stats into the one with the highest attack. So, uh, she just merged our things. If I were to attack now, the cycle would wipe out this poor little cultist, and we can't have that now, can we? So we'll bring in the golem. He'll hang out. We are still going to take five because of the ice mirror. This deals damage to me based on the highest attack on the field, which will be four. And then there is Stormgaze This Passage, which adds one spark token if I was not struck by a creature last turn. Deal direct damage equal to the total number of sparks. And then there is this minor complication, the Strangling Roots. We've held on to this Filling Feast for glory. And uh, to make sure I don't die. But the Strangling Roots will negate the first spell that I played and then destroy itself. So this game has a weird... Or this encounter specifically has a weird tempo. We'll call it a tempo. I'm not even gonna play anything this turn, I don't think. We just chill. Patience is key. Unify has gone in, and now we're gonna play the man with a go head. 
get that charge going. What? Well. Okay, never mind. Oh, it only charges if it has if it's played at six, right? Yeah, okay. That's fine. No big deal. So as much as it pains me, and it does pain me, um, I'm going to have to sacrifice Wave of Lava here. For the Dark Gods. For the Dark Patrons. The question is... Yes. The answer is yes. We sacrifice this. Now, because of Unify... It's not a good idea for me to play the Bound Fury. Actually, the Bound Fury is just kind of trash, isn't it? Hmm. I'm glad it unified into the man with the goat head. Actually, that's... Is that my win con? Interesting. Interesting. Because the man with the goat head... Uh, Fascinating. So the member they go ahead, when it attacks, it gives me borrowed life based on the damage it dealt, right? But if I can make this my highest attack on the field, Unify will keep pumping stats into this. So it can perfectly negate my Ice Mirror. Wow. Huh. That's pretty fun. <laughs> so Unify is coming in. Everything's going into this. This is a 22-22. And uh, that's GG. <laughs> wow, what a weird... Encounter. How much damage can I deal? 12. 12! Cool. Well, unfortunately I never got to use lava or anything, but, um... Man with a goat head? Hyper carry. This is in. If you're facing off against Haru, and you brought Empiricists, make sure to pick up a man with a goat head. The Acolyte's journey complete. Loane consumed the offerings of flesh. At last, his siblings culled from every field and forest. No one was left to challenge the rule of the victorious. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. And that was another excellent Acolyte of the Altar run. For some reason, I never put it together that the final boss was just the one deity you didn't bring. I don't know why that never clicked in my brain. But of course, you can always just do a mono run, so then does it flip a coin? Maybe. Possibly. But um, that was my run for the game's release. We got to see both sides of the coin, the major and the minor. These are, by the way, all the cards in the game. I think that this game has a good, strong foundation, but I would like to see more, like, additional features. Uh, one thing in my mind that I really equate to roguelike deck builders are, like, in Monster Train, it, they're called Covenants, where it's basically a scaling difficulty. I don't know how that would work, in this game because I feel like the game's already kind of tough. I mean, obviously we've run it over right with the Empiricist, but just one wrong step or one unfortunate start can really cripple you. So I don't know. And then of course there are these keeper bones. I don't know what the right levels are. I don't know what this does. Maybe this is meant to be the uh, like the covenant level. But yeah, you can let me know what you think. I hope the launch goes well for Black Kite Games. They are an indie team, of course. I believe there's only five people. So, uh, well done on your debut game. I enjoyed it quite a lot. 
And of course, you can let me know if you'd like to see more and if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching. Thank you to the patrons and the channel members who support the channel. I greatly appreciate you. If you'd like to stay updated with the Hamper channel, feel free to join the description down below, and I will see you next time. Bye.